Hello everyone and welcome back to another video in the Mastering Flask video course. In our last section, we saw how to log in our users and handle permissions. In this section, we will go over what an API is, what REST is, why REST is used to create APIs, and then we will use REST to create an API for our site's data. This is the first video in Section 6, What is REST? In this video, I am going to do a basic overview of RESTful APIs. So, what is an API? API, which stands for Application Programming Interface, is a set of methods or protocols that allow third-party applications to use or extend the functionality of an existing piece of software. For example, we have been using an API for a database this entire series to store and retrieve our stored data. In data-centric web applications, it is typical for the creators of the site to create an API that allows third parties to access the underlying data. This is a win-win because it allows third parties to easily grab the data without having to parse the data out of the HTML. And it's a win for the creators of the site because anything built off your site gives it free advertising. One prime example of this is Twitter, which had a very open API for programmers very early on, which led to many different and very popular apps being created that boosted Twitter's popularity and allowed it to be what it is today. For our application, we will create an API that allows third-party programmers to access the actor, movie, role, and post data. To do this, we will be using a type of API called REST. REST, which stands for Representational State Transfer, is not a protocol definition per se. Rather, REST is a set of constraints on APIs that are designed to force the API to adhere to best practices in both the client and server code. REST was invented after years of trial and error with other API protocols and standards, like SOAP or WSDL. These older protocols were either too complicated, too verbose, or both to really become effective. REST took off because it provided a simple way to express APIs that was immediately understandable to programmers who have worked on the web. Before we create our own REST API, we need to fully understand REST, and to understand REST, Let's walk through each of the constraints that REST requires. I'm going to use the term resource quite a lot. You can think of resources as objects in OOP. We can have users, actors, movies, and so on as resources. One of the big differences is that objects in OOP may have arbitrary methods to act upon them, whereas resources have a subset of fixed methods defined for them. OK, now we are ready to discuss the constraints. The first constraint requires that the client and the server must have a separation of concerns. The client cannot handle permanent data storage, and the server cannot handle anything with the user interface. This is in contrast to normal web communications, where the server sends the client HTML, which defines the output. In REST, the output and UI is handled by the client. This forces the creators of the server software to keep it simple for the client creators. The second constraint is that the server must be stateless. What this means is that any information that is necessary to handle requests are stored in the request itself or by the client. An example of the server being stateless is the session object in Flask. The session object does not store its information on the server, but on the client in a cookie. The cookie is sent along with every request for the server to parse and determine if the necessary data for the requested resource is stored inside of it, rather than the server storing session information for every user. This constraint is designed to radically simplify the server code, as tracking state across thousands of connections gets extremely difficult. The third constraint is that all resources provided must have a uniform interface. There are many different parts to this constraint. One, the interface is based around resources, which are models in our case. Two, data sent by the server is not the actual data in the server, but a representation. For example, the actual database is not sent with each request. Instead, a JSON abstraction of the data is sent. Three, the data sent by the server is enough information to allow the client to modify the data on the server. This will be shown more clearly when we start implementing the API, but essentially, we make sure to always send along an ID with the data so the third party knows what resource to modify. Four, every resource provided by the API must be represented and accessed in the same manner. For example, one resource cannot be represented in XML and one in JSON, one over raw TCP and one over HTTP. This constraint exists to force the server creators to keep the interface consistent for the client creators. And the final constraint 
is that the system must allow for layers, load balancers, proxies, caches, and other servers and services must be allowed to act between the client and the server as long as the final result is the same as if they were not there. This constraint is to allow the server creators to easily scale their services by adding new layers in over time. When a system adheres to all of these constraints, it is considered a RESTful system. The most common forms of RESTful systems are built off of HTTP and JSON. If you haven't used JavaScript extensively, or if you have never interacted with a web API before, you might not have heard of JSON. JSON is a data messaging format designed around the JavaScript syntax for creating objects. If you have only worked with Python, think of JSON as the Python dictionary syntax. JSON was designed to be easy for people to read and for machines to parse. Keep in mind that while the Python syntax for dictionaries and JSON syntax may look similar, they are different in some aspects. For example, you can't use single quotes for strings in JSON. Each resource is located on its own URI and is modified with different HTTP request types. Generally, it takes the following form. With the first type of request, a list of all the models in the resource are returned. The second type of request only returns the model which has a matching primary key. The third type of request creates a new model in the resource using the post form data contained in the request. The fourth type of request allows the third party to modify an existing resource with the matching primary key. Finally, the fifth type of request deletes a resource based on its primary key. With each request, we also return a HTTP status code along with the contents of the response. HTTP status codes allow programmers to know the status of the request without having to parse the message body. You have most likely encountered many of these codes already, like the 404 code, which means the requested resource is not found. The most important codes and their meanings are shown in this table. We will be using these codes a lot in this video. Okay, this video had a lot of content. First, we learned what an API is. Then we learned what REST is and what it forces the API to do and not do. Then we learned what JSON is.